All right, here's the word for this morning. The word is doxology. Everybody say that. Doxology. Say it one more time. Doxology. It's a beautiful word. It's actually not a word you'll find in the Bible, but it, um, it's throughout the Bible. It's kind of interesting. And it's not a word in the Bible, but doxology is throughout the Bible. What does doxology mean? It's actually made up of two other, two separate Greek words, doxa and logos. Doxa means praise, honor, or glory. And then logos means utterance or speech. What's the word? Doxology. We want to talk about doxology today. It's not in Scripture as a word, but it saturates the pages of Scripture. Sometimes there's a doxology, a statement of praise, or a statement of giving glory to God. Sometimes at the end of a segment of Scripture, if you go through the book of Psalms, there's five segments, and each one of them ends with a, any guesses? A doxology, a statement of praise. Sometimes it's right in the middle. We're going to look today at a doxology that's right in the middle of one of the Apostle Paul's letters. It's like he stopped mid-letter, mid so to say, and says it's time to praise God or to honor God. Doxologies have been important in church gatherings throughout the centuries. Many times they've been put to song. And uh, our church family, a number of years ago, would close each gathering by singing a doxology, and actually the, song, uh, the passage we're going to look at today, we sang for a number of months at the end of the service in order to just kind of rivet that in our minds. Some of you know a doxology, don't you? Sing it with me if you know it. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him, all creatures here below. Praise him above, ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. They almost always end with amen. We're going to talk about that in a minute as well. Why do we have these doxologies? Well, just like that doxology that we just sang, it rivets amazing truth about God. He is the one from which all blessings flow. It also reminds us that our lives should be statements of praise to God. We should be living a life of doxology. So what I want to do today, because we're right in between this crazy time approaching in December. What do we call it? We call it, I don't know what you call it. It's Christmas, right? And it's coming. And so I want us to pause right now. We start Advent next week and, and, and we just move into Christmas. I want us to pause and just praise. Look at a portion of scripture, a short portion of scripture. Actually, it's a very familiar portion of scripture to many of you and see how we can see our lives become more statements of praise. So here it is, the doxology. It's in Ephesians chapter 3. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be glory and the church, in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. And everybody says, that's a doxology. Now, it's interesting where it's situated in the letter. I told you it's right in the middle. But right before he goes into this doxology, he has this huge prayer. It's like this massive prayer where he's praying for these people that, that they would be able to understand how big God is and how great his love is for them. And then right after this doxology, he has this huge challenge. It's in chapter 4 where he says, you need to walk worthy of this great God. So it's sandwiched in between this big prayer and this big challenge and a reminder that God is able to do all of that. So this doxology, 
is the bridge between the prayer and the challenge. Reminding us some great things about prayer, reminding us about how it is that we can live our lives. So would you pray with me right now that we understand this more fully. Father God, thank you for the words of this doxology. Simple words, and they're brief words, but Lord, they're deep, and we pray that your Holy Spirit would teach us today. And that we would even be able to leave this place living more a life of praise and glory and honor to you. Amen. Now, there's a danger in doxology. I actually read one uh, commentator or one preacher that I look at often. He says it's dangerous to really dig into a doxology because you might ruin it. In other words, it's beautiful just as it is. That's a beautiful statement just as it is. So we don't want to dissect it too much that we leave here confused. So what we want to do is just look at four segments. And the doxology kind of breaks down into four very natural segments. And that's how we're going to cover it today. And to do that, as we go to the next slide, I'm going to ask us to read it a bit differently. All right? So we're going to start over here. We just happen to have four segments in here, don't we? So you guys are going to read the yellow, and you guys are going to read, any guesses? The blue, and you're the green, and you're the orange, and then we're going to say amen together. Can we do that? We'll see. <laughs> okay, get us started. Ready? Go. Now. Good job. Amen. That's kind of a strange word, but actually a very familiar word. You need to know that amen is there on purpose, and it's actually a Hebrew word. It's one of those strange Hebrew words that they decided not to translate. They just said, let's just bring it from Hebrew right into English. So in Hebrew, it would be pronounced more like amon, but it's amen. And what's it mean? It's, it comes from a root that means trustworthy or stable, or established, or firm. And we use it at the end of our prayers, not so we can say, that's the end. <laughs> we use it at the end of our prayers so we can say, I agree, or that's something I agree with, that's something that's true, and that's something that's established. Jesus uses this word, and sometimes in the New Testament, you'll actually find it not amen, but translated truly. He begins his statements by saying this is a trustworthy statement or this is a true statement. And here at the end of this doxology, it's used to confirm that this is a trustworthy statement of truth. And then to elicit agreement. So we all say together at the end of this, we say amen. We agree with the truth that is stated there. So let's look at this in four beautiful segments this doxology. First of all, we see the source. It says, now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think. Who is the him? The him is God. It's saying God is the one who is able. But it's an interesting word. It means power that is inherent by virtue of the source. So this is saying God is able because of who he is. God has the power. God is able. That ableness never changes. He is able because of the inherent power that he possesses as God. Now, I thought about that in relationship to us. Our ableness, so to say, changes, doesn't it? Every week when we see our grandchildren, it's interesting, they're able to do different things, and it's beautiful to watch. Some things that they couldn't say before, some things that they couldn't do, the next week they're able. And it's beautiful to see that process of them being able to do more things. But then something happens in life, right? Sometimes we get to an age and say, man, I used to be able to do that. I used to be able to do that. So our ableness changes. It increases and then it goes down. Understand God's ableness never changes. That's beautiful, isn't it? 
It's always the same. Another thing we need to recognize that God is able just because of who he is, and he, he's not dependent on anybody else to do what he wants to do. Let me say it another way. God needs no tools. Ladies, you need to know that's why we like tools, because it makes us able to do things. Frankly, sometimes I look for things I can't do so I can find a tool that I can go get to be able to do it. God doesn't need any tools. He just is able to accomplish the things that he desires to do. What is God able to do? Now, if you look at this verse, we don't see it at all in the English, but the Apostle Paul is so struck with the ableness of God that he creates a word. He takes three different Greek words, and he puts them all together to say, God is so able that I'm going to have to, there's not a word to describe it. So he takes a word that means above, and he takes a word that intensifies above, and then he takes a word that means exceeding in number, and he puts them all together, and I'm not even going to try to pronounce it for you, but it's this huge long word because he's trying to describe how able God is. And so it comes out like this. He's able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think. And in some translations, there's that beautiful word exceeding. When I first memorized this verse, it said, Now to him who is exceedingly able to do beyond all that we ask or think. And I want you to notice that he connects his ableness to what we ask and to what we think. Sometimes it's translated it's what we ask or can imagine. So understand, this isn't some abstract power or ability that God has. He actually connects it. He says it's so much greater than what you can even ask about. And then I love this next piece. My ability is so much greater that you can't even imagine it. So whatever we've asked in prayer, is God able to do that? No, he's so much more able to do that. Whatever you could imagine that you would think you'd like God to do or to happen, is God able to do that? Well, no, he's more than able to do that. And so this one verse causes us to ask this. How big is God to me? How able is my God? Now, in my studies this week, I found this verse printed a little bit differently. Let me just show it to you. And I want you to imagine as we go through this, it says, so where is your God on this? Is your God a God that's just able? He's just this abstract, powerful being out there? Or is your God a God that is able to actually do things? And even beyond that, is your God able to do more than you could ask? Or more than you could think? Or more than you could ask or think? Or is he able to do all or more than you ask or think? And that would be a great place for us to stop. But notice what we have here. Is your God able to do far more than all than we ask or think? Read that last line with me. Able to do abundantly far more than all that we ask or think. So which one of those lines describes your God? Which one of those lines describes the God that you came here to worship? Is he that last line? Is he the bottom line? Now listen, here's the bottom line. All of us in our lives act and do dependent on our concept of God. You've lived your life to this point based on your concept of God. That has channeled everything that you've done. So if your God is the one that's just able to do things abstractly, you've lived your lives that way. If your God is that bottom line that's abundantly able to do far more than anything I could ever imagine or even think, you live your life differently. So that's a real important question, isn't it? What's your concept of God? Let's move on to this next section. 
So we saw the source, the source is God, and then we see the channel or the vessel. Now this is interesting, according to the power at work within us. Now this is an amazing truth. What did I just tell you? Does God need any tools? He doesn't, right? He needs no tools. He can act independent, and sometimes he does that. We go back to Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God did it all, right? And everything exists because God did it. And we can read sometimes throughout Scripture that God works absolutely independently, but understand this, church. That's not God's SOP. What does SOP mean? Standard operating procedure. Sometimes God acts completely independent because he can. He needs no tools, but it seems like God's SOP is to channel his ableness, his ability, his power through vessels. That seems to be how he always, not always, how he generally works. And that word according is very, very interesting. It means that he works not just in proportion to his power, but proportionate to it. Let me tell you what that means. Here's a little illustration. If you were a billionaire, anybody up for that? If you were a billionaire and you gave me $10, thank you. You've just given me a portion of your wealth, just a portion, and actually a very small portion. But if you were a billionaire and you gave me $50 million, you've just given me in proportion to your wealth. You see the difference? One's a portion of it. One is proportionate to it. And so what this is saying is God chooses to work through his people in proportion to his power. Not just a portion of it, but proportionally. In other words, he is able to flow through us in amazing ways, proportioned to that exceeding abundant ability. Now that's mind-boggling to me. That this God who is able to do abundantly far beyond all that we can ask or think, chooses to direct that ableness through people on the planet throughout history and even today. And frankly, it sounds like a, can I say this? Sounds like a stupid plan. God's you know, you know, here it is for me. So I, I like to be independent. I say that not as a boast. It's really a fault. I like to do things myself. I like to control. I like to make sure it gets done. So I do it myself. Now, it's interesting. God just has another way of doing things. He says, yeah, I'm going to do things, but I'm not going to do it necessarily independent. I'm going to work through people. Isn't it amazing that he chooses to do that. Why does he do that? I actually don't know. I don't know why he would choose to do that. All I know that it gives us a great opportunity, doesn't it? That God would choose to flow his ableness through us on the planet today. What an honor, what a privilege, what an opportunity to be used. I might have shared with you before this ancient legend. It's a legend. It's not in the Bible about this time. And after his ascension, Jesus went up into heaven, and he's met by Gabriel, the archangel. And Gabriel was kind of saying, God, Jesus, you did amazing things there. But what happens next? How are you going to make sure that everything that you did is known throughout the world? And Jesus tells Gabriel, well, I I called some fishermen, and I called a tax collector, and I called some other men and women, and I, I gave them the truth, and they walked with me, and then I turned it over to them, and Gabriel looked a little puzzled. He said, do you have a plan B? <laughs> because he knew the fishermen, and he knew the tax collector, and he knew the people, and, and Jesus says, no, that's my plan. 
Understand, that's always been the plan that Jesus would come and make God known in a fuller way and then leave and then continue to channel his ableness and his fullness that super above and beyond and more than enough power of God through people. And in this time, through his church. So the Apostle Paul states that in a very succinct way, but it's interesting. It's almost every letter that the Apostle Paul writes, he wants the churches to know, this isn't about me or my ability, it's about God working through me. Let me just show you three statements, and we almost see the exact same formation. For this purpose also I labor, striving, read it with me, according to his power, which mightily works within me. Yeah, he's doing it, but the real power is God himself. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is, read it, God who is at work in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. I was made a minister, the Apostle Paul says, according to the gift of God's grace which is given to me, read it, according to the working of his power. He's saying, in proportion to the amazing power of God, this is why I do or how I can do what I do. It's even as Jesus told his disciples before he left, apart from me, you can't do anything. But it's only through my power. It's only as you abide in me and my fullness flows through you that there's any result that is good. And that leads us logically to the next section, the next beautiful section. We've seen the source and then the channel and then the glory. To him be the glory in the church, in the church and in Christ Jesus. That's why he gets the glory because whose power is it? It's his. We're just the vessel. We're just the channel. It's his power. He gets the glory in the end, not only in this life, but it will see forever. So I have an illustration, and frankly, it's just a silly illustration. I'm going to do it anyway. So I put these gloves on. Uh, it's been about a week and a half ago because there were a bunch of leaves in my yard. Anybody have that problem? And we needed to do something with the leaves. So I put the gloves on, and I went out, and I raked, and I piled them, and then I had to get them into the garden. And uh, they were just all over the front of our yard and driveway and and I just got it all done. It was just amazing what I did. <laughs> I came in, I took the gloves off, and I put them on the counter, and Kim said, man, those gloves did an amazing job. <laughs> well, actually, it'd be silly if she did that because the gloves didn't actually do anything, did they? I told you it was a silly illustration. Something went into the gloves that actually got the job done. And in the same way, and, and it's kind of a bad illustration because the gloves are lifeless. We're not lifeless. We have life. We have choice. We have will, all of that. And yet still God in us. It's God in us. It's God in us that accomplishes things that are good in our lives. That's why he gets the glory. That's why we're here today, not to boast of ourselves, right, but to boast of God who has done this work in us and continues to do it in us. So I want you to notice just in this section here, to him be the glory in the church. Now, that we need to remember that this, this thing that God is doing is not just us privately, but more us corporately. He's doing it through us together. And so he gets the glory in the church through us together. It reminds us that we don't serve God independently. We serve God together in unison. This reminds us that if we try to serve God independently, then we don't bring glory to him. And let me say this, when we have disunity within the church does God get glory? He doesn't. It's like that's when the glory stops. When this relational conflict comes in. 
It reminds us that it's impossible for God to get glory when we as his church try to function independently and allow disunity or conflict to come. It reminds us of one more thing, because that's true, because it's the glory through the church. Where will we always be attacked as a church? In our relationships. Because we can't glorify God independently. And so what the enemy is always trying to do is to divide us, to separate us, to get us off, to get us in conflict. That doesn't bring glory to God. He is able... We are the channel through which he pours his ableness. That's why he receives the glory as we submit to him and live in unity with one another. And then we move to this last section. We've seen the source, and then there's the channel, there's the glory, and now we have the forever piece. This is a beautiful piece. There's something that's interesting that happens as you get older. You start to think about the forever more often. (laughs) Now, I don't say that to be morbid. It's just the fact of the way it works. You start to think about other generations. As it says there, all generations. You start to think about the forever and ever more often. It just happens as you get closer because you get a little bit closer to the forever. But for those of you that are much younger, you know what this doxology tells you? It says you need to be thinking about the forever. You need to be thinking about the all generations. This doxology ends looking to the future, not just the short future, but the distant future, the forever future. And one of our great challenges as time block humans is we get stuck in the now. Has that ever happened to you? We just get stuck now in this certain situation now and this conflict now. And somehow the forever just vanishes. But the forever is still there. We just can't see it. So this doxology ends saying, look at the forever and the forever. This doxology pushes us beyond Just this short season, for those of you who are parents, you ever think, if I could just get through this season and get the kids grown? Yeah, you've thought that. Some of you are thinking, if I can just endure this job a little bit longer. Some of you are saying, if I could just get to retirement. I'm saying that's too short-sighted. We need to be thinking, what's happening forever and forever and forever? So here's how it works. When we recognize the great ableness of God and when we submit to his ableness so that he channels it through us, when we recognize our need to give him glory, something happens in the forever. In other words, what this is saying is he will receive glory not just now but when? Forever and ever and ever. It's a beautiful thing that we, as, we, as we process this in the midst of the daily grind that we're all just trying to get through, as we process this, and there's something happening forever that is giving him glory. And I don't know about you, but that puts a little more hope in the grind. That puts a little more hope in these grueling things we just have to work through. That by God's grace, if he can channel his ableness through me, and I can live in right relationship with people as he does that, then the end result is glory for Jesus, not just now, but how long? Forever. It's beautiful. That we can actually have our lives count for the glory of Jesus, not just now, but forever. It's a beautiful doxology. I hope we didn't ruin it by taking it apart too much. It's it's like, I thought about this earlier, it's it's like a frog. Frogs are kind of beautiful, but then when you dissect them, it's like, yeah. I I hope we didn't do that. This is a beautiful doxology. I don't want to ruin it, but I want you to understand that he is able, amen? And that we are the channel through which he flows his ableness. Amen? 
and we give him the glory over and over again. Amen? But it's also forever. You can say amen to that as well. Here's what I want to challenge you with as we go into the Advent season. If you haven't memorized this verse, and if we go to the next slide, I think we put it up there. I didn't encourage you to put it to memory. Put this to memory. This Advent season, in the month of December, this is the thing that's just going to be going through my mind, that he is able to do exceeding abundantly beyond all that we ask or think, according to the power that works within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Jesus Christ forever and ever. Let's read it out loud one more time. Shall we do it this way? You guys start with the yellow. Here we go. Do it. Now... Everybody says, Amen. Father God, thank you for this amazing plan that you would choose, that you would choose us to be vessels, that you would choose us to display yourself, that you would choose us to make yourself known on this planet. Lord, we're humbled by that. And, and Lord, there's nobody here, I'm sure, that says, yeah, I'm up for that. <laughs> Lord, we confess we're not up to that. We're not. And so we submit to you. Jesus, we acknowledge, even as you said, you are the vine. You're the source. And we just want to connect with you so that your life can be in us and flow through us. Lord, I would pray for, Lord, all of us here, for our church family, that as we move into Christmas and all that that means for all of us and our families, that you would just be the center of it. Jesus, you would be pleased to even flow your power through us to speak in different ways to people in our lives, maybe our family, maybe those we work with, that you would indeed, Jesus, be the center. So we want to give you glory and praise even right now, Jesus, as we sing these songs, so receive them from grateful hearts.